Friends, we now have some surprising discoveries from lost cities of the dead. A wise man once said, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. On February the 13th, 1961, Mike Michaelsall, Wallace Lane and Virginia Maxey were fossicking 4,300 feet up in Californians' Coso Mountains when they stumbled upon a, crust, a fossil encrusted rock. Expecting it to be a hollow geode stone, now if you don't know what a geode stone is, it's, it's a round stone, a little bit like a tennis ball. It's hollow inside and has crystals going in toward the centre. They thought it might be one of these. And so what they did was they got a diamond saw and do you know the next day they broke that saw on this object? The surprise turned wild when instead of a crystals they found inside the rock a mechanised device resembling a spark plug. Now subsequently this rock was dated at half a million years of age. Even if one rejected such an age, this sophisticated artefact did present a problem. It was still far too old to be explained by our conventional theories. And what shall we do about the steel cube? Obviously part of a machine, and certainly machine fabricated, which was discovered hundreds of feet below ground in a coal seam, supposedly 340 million years old. It was later exhibited in a Salzburg museum. Friends, this is only a, a drawing because the object has now disappeared, although there are some who claim that it is, has now been found again. It was written up in a uh, journal in Britain and also a scientific journal in France. Certainly it's a very interesting object and many more of these have been found down inside coal mines. On Easter Day 1901, divers working in a very old shipwreck on the seabed off Antikythera Island near Greece, brought up, among other relics, a metal artefact fused by the sea into a lump. The object collected dust for 50 years until it was restored by acid baths. You know, it proved to be a bronze machine with complex dials, movable pointers, inscribed plates and a sophisticated system of interlocking gears, actually more than 20 gear wheels, a differential gear, a crown wheel. It could work out and exhibit the motions of the sun, moon and planets. It could calculate their positions and the movement of the tides and the time of day. Friends, here is first class precision mechanics as accurate as any that can be made today. This computer was used for navigation purposes. It was a mechanism for checking one's position at night. With this, ships could sail anywhere in the world without being in sight of land. It's believed to be from about 55 BC, but it's doubtless of a much older technology. As a matter of fact, the scientist uh, De Sella Price uh, he made a statement that this was like finding a jet plane in the tomb of Tutankhamun. A German scientist was wandering through the uh, museum in Baghdad and he came across an object that was labelled as a cult object. And this is quite a common procedure uh, with museums that if something is not quite understood it's often thought to be a cult or a religious object of some sort. But uh, this German scientist believed it was more than this. So what he did was to take it away and it tested out as a battery. Friends, we've got here something which is quite sophisticated, uh, in tested working order, six inches high, and utilising iron, copper, electrolyte with asphalt as an insulator. Now, those at uh, Sassafon were broken down into the component parts as though they'd been mass produced, and their manufacturer had been interrupted before assembling the pieces into working batteries. Altogether 15 of these have been found and they are estimated to be about 2,000 years old. Now, 
a skeptic at one of my programs in New Zealand recently suggested that this uh, metal rivet from the arc site could hardly have been uh, produced back so early because the people would need electricity to produce it. Well, friends, here we have electricity 2,000 years ago, and there is good evidence of electricity long before that as well. Now, electricity, of course, is needed to produce uh, something of this caliber with its very refined uh, alloy system of uh, iron and uh, aluminum and uh, titanium. But I do believe that before the flood, they had an industrial revolution. The book of Genesis talks about a man called Tubal Cain, who was an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. So he taught metallurgy. There was a technology before the flood, and this man lived about 300 years before the flood. Now, friends, discoveries such as these do pose awkward questions. Around the world, sitting in museums and in basements, there are some very sophisticated metal objects which would require a very high technology to produce, a technology not to be repeated until our day. Let's look at some of the houses of the ancient world. Recent discoveries have astonished archaeologists. Evidence of private houses fully equipped with upstairs ensuite bathrooms, tiled floors, hot and cold running water, flush toilets, patterned wallpaper made of, I'm going to say this and I'm going to shock somebody, aluminium, gold or silver sheets as thin as our wallpaper today, glass window panes, fine carpets and luxurious furniture, and modern gadgets that one dares not mention lest he be branded a liar. Now Alexander Graham Bell, when he invented the telephone, said the old things have been reinvented. I wonder why did he say that? Frederick Soddy, British nuclear scientist and a Nobel Prize winner, wondered whether the ancients might have, might have achieved secrets and accomplishments that went beyond those that we have attained. Why did he say that? Did he have access to some ancient musty documents of the past? I was talking about wallpaper. Now friends, wallpaper of sheet gold, silver and aluminium, every square inch of it decorated with intricate designs and figures and scenes has been found in rolls on cities within the Amazon jungle. Here is a, uh, uh, an Amazon man. Now you notice he's got someone else with him too. These are the head shrinking people of the Amazon jungle, the Hevero tribe. I had an expedition down there. In fact, my very first expedition down into the Amazon was to meet these people a few years ago. And near them there are other people in eastern Ecuador who are bringing in from the ruins of ancient cities, these walls of, uh, these rolls rather, of wallpaper. Now, these are of aluminium or gold or silver. And today these are being torn by native artifact hunters from the walls of ancient buildings. Long abandoned, vine choked buildings in the inaccessible eastern jungles of Ecuador. Now, if only one could glimpse these before they are finally destroyed. But I tell you, friends, here we have a technology. These are riveted together. They're huge sheets up to 24 feet long and 8 feet high. Friends, archaeologists are puzzling over drawings in Egyptian buildings such as these. A wall carving here depicts a scene where attendants uh, seem to be carrying giant light bulbs with interior filaments in the shape of snakes connected to a box or switch with braided cables and which strongly suggest powerful electric lamps supported by high tension insulators. The cables are an exact copy of engineering illustrations as currently used. The cable is shown as very heavy and striated, indicating a bundle of uh, many multi-purpose conductors rather than a single high voltage cable. When you go to Egypt, 
you go to some of the undisturbed tunnels and tombs, you'll notice that there is no smoke on the ceilings. Now, compare this to medieval Europe where you have uh, uh, buildings that have smoke on the ceilings and on the upper parts of the walls. Because in medieval Europe, of course, they used light sources which generated smoke, candles, oil lamps, and so on. But today in the 20th century, as in ancient Egypt, there is no smoke on our ceilings. Could it be that there was a light source that uh, we have forgotten the ancients possessed? There are many stories about such a light source around the world from the Amazon to J Japan and in between. Now, here we have an object in Mexico which has been enlarged so much but the original size, the life size, is no larger than a pin. A pinhead. And here you have the detail. How possibly could that have been engraved on a pinhead? Could it be that these people knew the art of lenses? Well, here we have a lens, a crystal lens found in an Egyptian tomb. And lenses, which implies telescopes and microscopes, have been found in quite a few ancient cities around the world. There is evidence of a sudden appearance of instant civilizations. The commonly held view is that we came up from savage Stone Age beginnings. It was a slow but steady development to civilization. However, friends, actual discoveries show this is not so. All cultures began suddenly and fully developed. A long preliminary period is not supported by archaeology. The evidence shows no transition whatsoever between the ancient civilizations and any primitive forebears. They did not rise to their peak. They were at their peak from the beginning. So take, for example, Egypt. We all know this is a symbol of Egypt, the Sphinx here at Giza. Egypt sprang into existence suddenly, fully developed, that is, without transition from a primitive state with a fantastic ready-made civilization. Great cities, enormous temples, pyramids of overwhelming size. Now here is a building 48 stories high, the Great Pyramid at Giza. You notice the people here on the camels. Pyramids, as I said, of overwhelming size. Colossal statues with expressive, tremen tremendous expressive power. Luxurious tim tunnels and tombs, splendid streets, perfect drainage systems and even a ready-made writing already perfected, a well-established naming system in which every pharaoh had as many as five names. Society was already divided at the beginning into specialist classes and a court which exhibited all the indications of well-defined precedence and form. I tell you, friends, in the remotest period of which there are records, Egypt and its sister civilizations show a level of civilization that is inexplicable. We have here Babylon. <clears throat> Babylon rose in the site where Samaria had first of all risen. Samaria appeared around the same time as Egypt, a civilization sudden, unexpected, and out of nowhere. And in the same fertile crescent we go to Baalbek. See the size of the man. Now, Baalbek conceals a mystery that may never be solved. Two magnificent Roman temples were built upon this great existing platform, an immense prehistoric dressed platform. And those two temples which were built on top of this, which were the greatest in the Roman world, were dwarfed by this platform. The platform is a feat of engineering that has never been equaled in history. And here we have individual stones. Look at the size of this one here. One stone, two stories above the ground. 
lifted into place. This would weigh anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 tonnes. Now, you notice they're raised into the building so high and there are tunnels in the walling large enough for a train to go through. Now, even with the tools of modern technology, friends, we could not do something like this today. We could not move these building blocks intact. Our largest railway cars could hardly budge, let alone lift and, and, and carry these. It would take three of our largest overhead cranes, hoisting 400 tonnes each, to uh, lift these. And I don't think it could be done without the stress breaking the, these objects. Supposing a block could be manoeuvred onto a wheeled vehicle, the enormous load would drive the wheels into the ground and grind them to pieces on the rock surface. We have here a mystery. Now a third coincidence, we have the, the, have the rising of Egypt suddenly. We have the rising of Samaria suddenly. And a third coincidence was the sudden rise of the Indus Valley civilization about the same time. Now here we have an aerial view of one of these cities in the Indus Valley, which is now located in Pakistani territory. These also appear to have suddenly sprung up with no clear-cut traces of having evolved from primitive beginnings. <coughs> What is one to make of this? Well, yes, I know the uh, 19th century evolution theory was um, developed and was foisted on us and in our education system that man came up from the mud and he gradually rose higher and higher until he became clever as we are today. But could this be a myth? If the evidence is showing us so many surprises from the past, could it be, friends, that we have been mistaken in this theory? Could man have come down, not up, originally? The known facts are these. We have fully developed civilizations, several of them, sharing many features in common, suddenly springing out of nowhere. We have language and script and agriculture and anthropological and archaeological finds that point to a common origin in the Middle East highlands. And the discovered writings of these ancient people all speak of a vanished golden age. And not only that, nearly all traditions of the ancient races worldwide tell us that the biblical history is true. That man was very, very smart in the beginning. Now, Professor Albright of uh, John Hopkins University said, this excessive skepticism shown toward the Bible by important historical schools has been progressively discredited. He says that discovery after discovery testifies to the accuracy of the Bible. I think, friends, that the Bible has been unjustly criticized in the past by people who did not know the facts of ancient technology, which confirms that the biblical viewpoint of history is, after all, well on track. Not only do we have these civilizations springing up suddenly, but we also have a common origin. Scripts of various cultures reveal a common origin. From Egypt to China to Easter Island to North America and the Indus Valley, there is a distinct link between them. Now, the pre-flood world was a world of high civilization. But man was morally corrupt and violent. After the global flood, the sole survival vessel landed up here in the mountains near Ararat. And if we pinpoint the uh, subsequent instant civilizations that arose across the world in a short space of time, we find that Ararat, the dispersion point, lies precisely in the middle. Now, there can be only one conclusion re regarding this, friends that from Ararat the descendants spread out around the world and they took with them an advanced knowledge that had been preserved through the ark, knowledge that enabled new civilizations to spring up suddenly. The oldest civilizations we have on earth appear just long enough after a disaster such as the flood for a population increase to produce another culture. 
when the nations of the earth spread out, they found that most of the earth was still very covered with water. For example, what is now today the Sahara Desert was once a great inland sea. If you go to Egypt today, you'll see a name very prominently. It's the name Misra, Misra, Misra Travel Agent, Misra Road, Misra Hotel. Misra is a shortened form of Mizraim. Now, Mizraim was a grandson of Noah. Mizraim came down to Egypt and he found that Egypt was still largely covered in water. There was no course to the Nile. It was spreading out everywhere. Large amounts of water were rushing off the continent still. And Mizraim embanked the Nile and made much of the land around the Nile habitable. In fact, the name Mizraim means the embanker. And Mizraim made Egypt here a land that could be settled in. There is evidence worldwide of great inland seas after the flood. We have puddles up here in Australia. Australia had a great inland sea. Asia was largely covered by water. As we saw in Africa, it was the same. In North America, there was a large inland sea left behind by the flood. Over here in South America, we do, do not have a, an Amazon jungle millions of years old, as sometimes is speculated. As recently as 3,000 years ago, this was just one great inland sea. And there's even an old map that shows this. Now, friends, the Chinese, when they came to China, they said that they had to drain the country and get rid of dragons that were there. And as we know, Mizraim, likewise, drained Egypt. In fact, this is the story of the ancient races. And these people did more than this. They actually went out mapping the land. There are many old maps. In fact, we have about 14 of them. Most of these are on a spherical projection. You notice here the, the similarity between this ancient map, which is basically thousands of years old. It's recognised as a medieval map, but the copyists said that they used sources which were much, much older. And if you compare this with a satellite uh, sketch map of the, of the Earth, you'll notice there's a very strong similarity. We're talking here about a round Earth known by the ancients. Here is an ancient map of Antarctica alongside a modern map of Antarctica. And where today we have uh, uh, glaciers, the old maps show there were rivers. These people knew and mapped the whole world back there. Now here we have from Egypt a world map. If we were to draw a line horizontally and vertically through the Great Pyramid at Egypt and you were to measure the amount of land space in each of these four squares, it's equal. Now by accident or design the Great Pyramid marks the precise centre of the land mass of the world, north, south, east and west. And each quarter has exactly the same number of square miles of land. This does suggest to us that a world survey was once made. They went to places like Easter Island. They knew about the Americas. For example, Christopher Columbus only discovered what had been found long, long before and forgotten by many. <coughs> now here in South America we have some very interesting country. It's my favourite continent. You notice that here we have a great cliff going down, a big drop about probably 3,000 feet, maybe 1,000 metres down. And here on the side of, of a huge hill up in the Andes Mountains, we have a pathway that's been put right round the mountainside toward the ruins of an ancient city. Here is a drawbridge and when the enemy came along the drawbridge could be uh, taken off and the enemy could not get through. But however did they do this? I mean it's impossible to stand here let alone build constructions. These people did not know the impossible. These jewellers in stone. And I remember my first trip down the Amazon. I took a little bus for two days and I had a man sitting beside me actually uh, chewing betel nut. The chickens and, and the little pigs and dogs were running all over the bus and, and, and fighting and this man sat beside me for two days and occasionally he would drowse off then suddenly he'd clear his throat and he would expectorate onto the seat in front of me which was overhanging my legs. But as the bus went around the mountainsides it was very very steep 
and uh, sometime uh, we would find that the, there was a big chasm away down on one side, and uh, just like this narrow pathway here, there was just enough room for the bus to come round. And I remember one occasion when the bus was uh, negotiating this area, and uh, there was on the side of the, the road a, a slip that had come down the cliff. And so the bus wheels went right sideways around this, and I could look away down the drop. I'll tell you, it's, it's an unforgettable experience. Mark Chu picture was well known on travel brochures. And friends, I just want you to notice this. this we have this here 9,000 feet, 3,000 metres above sea level. On three sides there is a canyon. The canyon goes behind and back on this side. And this is a razorback. Notice how they built right on, their terraces right onto the edge of the cliff. And how they did that is absolutely amazing. But did you notice the terraces up here? Most people don't ever dare go up there, but these people constructed things up here. When the uh, clouds move, this is very, very beautiful. The waterfalls come right down from mountains 20,000 feet high. But the civilizations of South America were very, very advanced. Today, the descendants of the Incas are a, a very uh, re re depressed and, and a very suppressed people. But back in the early days, even before the Incas, there was a great civilization which did masterpieces in stone. You notice here a stone which uh, has been put into place, and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen sides to it. Now, how possibly could they have put that in? And this is not an isolated case, this was a common building method. Now, not only sideways and on top and, on, and, and below, but backwards behind, the, the stone had to fit into other stones as well. And uh, to anyone who would suggest that this was done simply by rubbing the stones together until they fitted, let's get real about this, friends. These people were cleverer than, than we thought they were. Here we have the sun gate in Tiwanaku in Bolivia a city which appears to have been built by giants, absolutely amazing, carved out of one piece of solid rock, brought from a quarry many miles away. Now here we go to China. China, if you didn't know it, has the largest man-made structure on this planet. And I'm not talking, talking about the Great Wall of China. Here we have a pyramid. And this pyramid is larger than the Great Pyramid of Cheops. It's located 40 miles west, that's about 65 kilometres west of Xi'an, in Shenxi province of northwest China. It's on the old Marco Polo silk route. And there are seven of these pyramids. They actually uh, have colours on their sides, a flat top. The four colours on one side and, and another colour on the top. After all this time, the colour is still uh, perceptible. And the Chinese say they're not going to excavate these because man is spiritually not right. And tourists are not taken here. But these have been photographed from the air at least twice. Now here's a comparison between the largest pyramid in Shenzi, which is 1,200 feet tall, and uh, other well-known buildings like the Cheops Pyramid in Egypt, the Empire State Building in New York, here we have the most massive building in the world. In an ancient scripture, we have this question. Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their windows? Well, friends, if we go across to Egypt and South America, for example, over here in South America, in Venezuela, in Costa Rica and in Colombia, we have models being, have been found in tombs representing, may I say, resembling modern jet planes. They possess delta wings, engine housing, a cockpit, windshield, flanged tail and elevators. Now these models have passed aerodynamic tests. Fourteen models are known to exist. Some of them have two sets of wings. 
Now here we have in Egypt, found at Saqqara in a tomb in 1898, an object that was thought to be a bird. And it was stuffed in a box of bird models in one of Cairo Museum storerooms. It was rediscovered in 1969 and found to fly perfectly as a glider. There are indications, however, that it may originally have possessed a propulsion mechanism at the tail. The design is highly sophisticated. The Paleontological Museum of the USSR, as it was, has a skull of a prehistoric Uruk bison, pierced by a small round hole of an almost polished appearance without any radial cracks indicating a projectile entered at high velocity. This has been examined by a Berlin forensic expert and I believe there's a, a human skeleton, not a human skeleton, rather a skull, that has the same uh, wound in it, same type of wound. Now friends, this one here is not of recent times because the animal, which is now extinct by the way, was alive and that's shown by the edges of the wound having calcified over indicating that this animal did survive the shock. Now skeletons in Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa in the Indus Valley civilization are extremely radioactive. The ruins of these ancient Indus Valley civilizations and cities are immense. They're thought, these cities, by the way, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro are thought to have contained a million people each. Practically nothing is known of their histories except both were destroyed suddenly. And in Mohenjo-Daro, in an epicenter 150 feet wide, that's 50 meters wide, everything was crystallized, fused or melted. 150 feet from the center, the bricks are melted on one side, indicating a blast. Ancient Indian texts speak of a city's people giving, being given seven days notice to get out of the city a clear warning of total destruction. And excavations down to the street level revealed 44 scattered skeletons as if doom had come suddenly and they could not get out of their houses. All the skeletons were flattened to the ground. A father, mother and child were found flattened on the street, face down and still holding hands. And my friends, these skeletons after thousands of years are still among the most radioactive that have ever been found. As a matter of fact, they're on a par with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Seven years after the first successful atom bomb blast in New Mexico, Dr. Oppenheimer, who was familiar with ancient Sanskrit literature, was giving a lecture at Rochester University. During the question and answer period, a student asked Dr. Oppenheimer a question to which Oppenheimer gave a strongly qualified answer. The student said, was the bomb exploded at Alamogordo during the Manhattan Project, the first one to be detonated? Dr. Oppenheimer replied, well, yes, in modern times, of course. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, there's some dead men's secrets for you. I believe, friends, that there'll be people who will be asking questions about this and saying, well, where can we get more information? Well, that book, Dead Men's Secrets, which we'll tell you more about after the next program, contains a thousand forgotten secrets of the ancients. And it represents uh, 12 years research in over 30 countries, and in each chapter there's a different subject. In one chapter we go into ancient metallurgy. In another one, ancient medicine. Another one, ancient art or ancient electricity or ancient flight, ancient geography. There's so many fascinating topics in which the ancients excelled. And I'd like to recommend that book. And uh, I trust that uh, if you get this, you're going to have a lot of fun delving into the past Secrets which should be known about, secrets which are hidden, sometimes suppressed, but certainly subjects which are fascinating. <laughs>